from Nebraska who grew up with a bag full of magic tricks and has been working late night magic ever since. Johnny Carson. Sorry, lady, I don't need any encyclopedias. Thank you. Here's Johnny. Johnny Carson has been the king of late night television for 22 years. But his network stardom began in 1956 with a quiz show called Who Do You Trust? You don't think that's going to work. Even 25 years ago, the style, the timing, and those deadpan looks were already his trademarks. And the young Midwesterner who came to Hollywood and went to work as a comedy writer for Red Skelton was a comedy smash on his own. With The Tonight Show, the Carson style of comedy has become an American staple and his monologues a reflection of the country and its politics. I understand James Watt is being treated right now at the Earl Butts Foot in the Mouth Clinic. <laughs> I understand Reagan had a, ca had a cabinet meeting today, and they really had a lot of laughs. Uh, Watt was there, and he was telling deaf president jokes. And one of the ways he looks at the country is through the characters who need it. Good evening, this is Walter Cronkite. For the past 19 years, I've been sitting at this desk reporting all of the major news stories in the world. Tonight is my final one personal note. For God's sakes, knock off that tickety, tickety, tickety sound. From the White House in Washington, D.C., meet the Reagan family. Ronald, Nancy, and Ron Jr. 100 people surveyed. Top five answers on the board. Here's the question. Name something you'd find on a farm. Yes, name something you'd find on a farm. Well... Is there a well? <laughs> There's a well! You got it! I'm in the one answer, Ron. Are you going to play it? The personal side of Johnny Carson, he considers just that. Personal. He and his first wife, Jody, were married for 15 years and had three sons. Which to his second wife, Joanne, ended in divorce in 1972. But it is his divorce from his third wife, Joanna, that has made headlines this year. She has asked for $220,000 a month in settlement. I heard from my cat's lawyer today. <laughs> my, my cat wants 12000 a week for tender vittles. When Johnny Carson goes on stage, he will make jokes about his divorce. But when he comes here to Malibu, to the beach house where he moved after his separation from Joanna, he prefers not to talk about it. The past year has been a difficult one for him emotionally. In addition to the divorce, Johnny lost his father, who died at the age of 83, a loss that Johnny describes as being far more traumatic than he ever expected. At 58, Johnny Carson is at the peak of his career, and he is as physically fit as a man in his 30s. He works out in a gym he put in the beach house. The drums he plays for relaxation are worlds apart from the opulent house he and Joanna shared it. Well, this is where I in come when it, No, when the tides come in at Malibu, you have to have a second story. <laughs> you have to have very high. After last winter. John, Johnny Carson is today one of the most powerful men in Hollywood, so one might expect to find several servants here, but there are none. He says he doesn't even mind cooking for himself. Johnny Carson, private citizen. I know you don't like personal questions, mm -hmm. and I will honor that. Uh -huh. So I will start by asking you something very simple and easy for you to answer. Okay. Will you tell me all about your first sexual experience? My first <laughs> sexual experience? <laughs> it was a disaster. I'm kidding! I never thought I was, you'd... You're really going to answer it? Sure. I never expected that. I thought I was being funny. Go it ahead. It was an absolute disaster. I don't want to ask anything else. I'm afraid you this wanna, is going to be... Do you want me to really tell you? Okay. I was 17 years old, in high school. Want to know the girl's name? <laughs> I don't think so. I'm going to go to a whole other subject. Okay. <laughs> You're fine on this, but I'm not. This has been quite a year for you, hasn't it? Oh, yes. How this would is, you describe this? It's been a fun year. Uh, a little boring routine. Well, um... The personal life, of course, has been in, uh, in all the papers, day after day after day. And uh, 
that comes with the territory. Somebody said years ago, if you want to be in the public eye as an entertainer, you have to take what comes with it. And I guess what comes with it is the fact that people, for some reason, are interested in what you do in your personal life. So that, that's part and parcel of uh, being the public eye. When you read every day about a new romance, uh, do, you, do you say to yourself, that comes with the territory? Well, I think any time you even take someone to dinner, uh, that's a romance out here. Mm -hmm. It's like every house in California is an estate. The first house I bought in California was out in Encino, many years ago in the 50s. And uh, at that time, it was a lot of money. And I sold the house later to Johnny Cash, believe it or not. And I did hardly at the time know who Johnny Cash was. Two years ago, a real estate dealer from Encino sent me a brochure. They were trying to sell this house. All of a sudden, this nice little house in Encino that I bought was now a former celebrity's estate. So if you go to dinner out here, it's a romance. But then again, that's, uh, that's part of it. And you can take it that easy? Oh, I think you have to. Hmm. Really think you have to. Otherwise, it's going to eat you up and you get angry and resentful. It doesn't serve any purpose. When you come out and do your monologues, which are really based on what you've read, do you go home and worry about things? Do you worry about this country? Are there things that really bug you that you can't say in the year? Uh, you're going to get serious, aren't you? A little bit. I think one of the dangers, if you are a comedian, which basically I am, if you start to take yourself too seriously mm. um, and start to comment on social issues, your sense of humor suffers somewhere. I've seen other people, whose names I won't mention, who mm -hmm. do humor. And then somewhere along the line, they start to want to make their views known. I try to do it humorously. Mm -hmm. Uh, I try not to, uh, and we've had some criticism on the show. Some critics over the years says, well, the show has no great sociological value. It's not controversial. It's not deep. The Tonight Show basically is um, to amuse people, to make them laugh. Are there certain people now whom you can sort of automatically talk about and the audience will laugh? Yeah, I'm going to miss James Watt. <laughs> uh, I really miss James Watt, as I missed Earl Butts. He's not going to miss you. <laughs> no, he's not going to miss me. <laughs> Who can't you uh, tease and, and make jokes about? Mother Teresa is a bad subject. I would think so. You don't get big laughs with Mother <laughs> Teresa. What did you think you wanted to be when you were not a kid? Because, I don't know, maybe then you wanted to be a fireman or something. But when you had to, to, to begin to think of what did... I heard that at one point you wanted to be a psychiatrist. I heard you wanted to be a journalist. I think I wanted to be an Amway salesman. And you flunked. <laughs> you couldn't do it. <laughs> I probably went through all those things that kids go through. Yeah, psychiatry intrigued me. Uh, journalism intrigued me for a while. I took journalism in college. But I've been entertaining since I was a kid, and I knew that somewhere along the line, that's probably what I would do. Were you considered then a very shy, introverted kid? Yeah, I think so. I went back and looked at my high school annual the other day, and uh, the word conceit I'd see once in a while or stuck up. People didn't understand the shyness. I think a lot of times when they see people that they think are aloof, yeah. all words that have been attributed to me at one time or another, or cool. Still. Yeah, or reserved, are really a basic shyness. Mm -hmm. An uncomfortableness sometimes around large groups of people. And so you kind of retreat. I think one of the reasons I took up magic as a kid was the fact that it gave me a chance to get out in front of people and kind of subordinate your own personality yeah. and become somebody else, become a magician. A chance to get out in front of people and kind of subordinate your own personality yeah. and become somebody else, become a magician. So that worked. What's your strongest childhood memory? As I say it, <clears throat> what pops up? Growing up in a small Midwestern town and uh, being quite comfortable and um, having, I think, basically a, a fairly average childhood mm -hmm. in a small Midwestern town. Uh, but strong memories were just the fact that uh, you knew everybody in town. There was a certain closeness about it. I went back a few years to go to a special there. Yeah. And I found, found it very emotional. In the special that you did a year ago when you went back home, mm -hmm. there was a homecoming football game. Right. Suddenly, to your surprise, everybody began to sing happy birthday yes. to you. Your brother and sister were there. Mm-hmm. And you began to cry on camera. The tears mm -hmm. came. Okay. I knew this was coming. Uh, and you said... Don't let me do this, it's going to spoil my image. <laughs> That's right. Right? Is that the way you want to be? When you say it'll spoil my image, is it almost something that's now... No, that was, I suppose that was a self-defensive type of thing. 
Maybe it goes back to um, your upbringing that little boys were not supposed to show emotion. You know, that's the way a lot of children were taught. Little girls could cry, little boys did not express their emotion. A lot of men have that problem. You, you, can, you can feel things very strongly and feel a very uncomfortable expressing them. Not yeah. that it's a weakness. I don't think it is at all. I find it much easier to do now. I, I can touch people now, or I can, somebody can come up and... Uh, and touch you. Sure. Uh -huh. um, but if you're not brought up that way, it's hard to, to change your basic personality. Do you feel things strongly? Oh, very strongly. Do you sure. cry? Certainly. Do you find it hard to let people get through to you? I mean, I don't want to play amateur psychiatrist. You know what That's you know all what right. The rates are very, very inexpensive. Okay, yeah, so we're here. Normally, Why not? normally <laughs> it goes for 40 50 bucks an hour. I mean, if, if there's a freebie, fine. Have you been in analysis? I have uh, seen a psychiatrist uh, occasionally, not, not frequently. Do you open up? Sure. Or do you say it's none of your business? <laughs> <laughs> what are you asking me those questions for? I mean, no, I don't think that shows, I think, a, a lot of people. It's just someone else to talk with sometimes and uh, to ask some questions and try to get in touch with, you, with your feelings. Mm -hmm. uh, I think it can serve a purpose. Do you have people you can talk with? Sure, I have some close friends, not a lot of close friends. Mm -hmm. Depends what you mean by friends. Somebody once said friends are people you can, uh, you can cry with or you can tell mm -hmm. anything to and know that it will go no further. That's hard. Uh, and that's very difficult. Uh, I have some close friends. I have a lot of acquaintances. Everybody has lots of acquaintances. Yeah. But there's a difference. When you have to, maybe especially now in these times, when you really have a very difficult day, or even without being corny, if your heart is broken, you know, and you've got to then go out there and be funny, mm -hmm. how do you do it? That's your job. If you're going to entertain and you have to go on a stage or in front of a television camera, you have to set aside, for the moment, what's happening personally. Mm -hmm. Sure, there are times you have a lot of things on your mind, but strangely enough, once you get out there and it starts to roll and the audience reacts and you get the laughs, you set everything aside do you? and you do the show. You may have a terrible letdown after the show. That's one of the problems of something like this. You have these, you have these big mood swings. He said once, Maybe it's talking about mood swings. That you are a man of great highs and great lows. Mm-hmm. What was the best? And what was the lowest? I suppose for most performers, the time that you really have that exhilaration is when you are performing. Mm -hmm. And things are going well. And the reaction is all there whether it's the audience and you find yourself performing where you can almost do no wrong. Mm. You really uh, do love it. I like what, yeah, I love yeah. what I do. I still find it a challenge. So I, I'm not looking forward to the point, oh, if I do this a few more years, I can yeah. quit and sit. Sit and do what? You know? Mm. So that, that, that's the high. Low points have been, I suppose, the lowest, lowest point I had was, when I, when I, was my first divorce because my children were quite young and that sense of failure uh, overcomes you uh, that you have uh, been less than you should have as a husband or a father mm -hmm. and those guilt feelings can be overwhelming at times especially if the children are young that's probably one of the big low points I had does it get easier if it's not if it's the second divorce or the third <laughs> divorce <laughs> it's never comfortable it's never comfortable you know, I wish I had another explanation for it. I don't. One of the things that you do, and one of the things that you've been doing, is to make humor out of the situation. The decision you have to make is how do you want to handle it. You don't want to be bitter about it. Yeah. You don't wish to uh, do any jokes that are cruel or to hurt anyone. So you try to turn it and take the, the joke on yourself if you can. And have fun with it, the, the situation. Uh, and that's what you do. You just sit and you, it's a gut instinct. You're really very, I was going to say very moral, and maybe in a funny way what I mean is very square, because you always get married. Yeah, yeah, there must be something to it. <laughs> you know, I keep trying it. Could you again? I, I'm not even, uh, it's the mm -hmm. furthest thing from my mind. Mm -hmm. Under the best of conditions, it's very hard to be happy. You know, so whatever that means. Whatever that means. Right. What does it mean to you? 
Well, I know that you don't go out looking for happiness. Mm. I think if you're happy in your work and you're, you're relatively happy with yourself, you don't go out looking for it. Mm. So are you happy? Relatively. What would be your idea of the perfect day? The perfect day? Yeah. One of those questions, huh? Hmm. Listen, years ago I asked you if you were hospitalized, who would you want in the next bed? Do you remember that? And I said the best doctor in the world. That's right. Yes. So well, I'm getting better, you see. Now makes, I only ask about sense. perfect days. That <laughs> didn't make sense. I don't know. I, I heard you ask somebody once what kind of a tree no, would you like to No, I be. did not. Now, while yes, we're clearing up did. misconceptions, but you know why I did? What kind of a tree would no, you just like a, to be? What kind of a, of a tree would you like to be? It might be a tumbleweed. <laughs> <laughs> Everybody's going to say that I asked you that and I was led into it. What happened was that Catherine Hepburn said, hmm. well, I'm like an old tree. Uh, and you, tree what right? kind of a tree? Okay, I take and it back. She said, well, all right. A perfect day. I suppose if you wake up to start with, <laughs> it's still it. if you wake up and you're not in the obituaries, that's a wonderful start. Okay. If I had a sentence that went, Johnny Carson is a man who, finish off that sentence, please. Is this a multiple choice? Anything you want. I hated these in school. Okay, try one. Johnny Carson is a man who, I don't know how to answer that. You caught me completely off. Whose ass is very tired right now. <laughs>